Welcome back for another episode of Growing Joshua Trees from Seeds. It's day 1822. I'm going to keep it in a four digit format within the episodes because it's convenient and more granular. So this episode covers years 4.9 all the way to 5.6. It's a significant amount of time and as you can see the scaled insects are back. I haven't applied pyrethrin analogs for quite a while. I've used imidacloprid which I thought would grant the entire plant systemic resistance but apparently it's not working and I don't think I ever got rid of all the scale insects on this plant back in years three and four when the infestation was really bad not that that ever seemed to stop the plant so it's been doing very well ever since and as you'll see throughout this episode uh, this Joshua tree is bigger than ever, although it's growing at a glacial pace compared to all my other plants. But it's also the toughest plant, so these leaves can withstand a ton of damage. And a few scale insects won't really change anything. So I've been scraping them off here and there, but I might have to apply some other kind of pesticide since the imidacloprid doesn't seem to work on them. So this was still my old apartment. This fertilizer concentration that I'm spraying from this bottle is way too high, but the volume I used is very low. So um, I think it was this blue at this point because I tried to follow the instructions, but maybe I measured wrong or um, actually I don't think so. I think I was actually measuring right for the first time, but I'm using uh, one of the big miracle Grow scoops. Uh, per gallon of water rather than a uh, small scoop as I started to use later on in this episode. So I sprayed some water as customary in the past to kind of wash off the trunk and on day 1865, this was April 2020, it was about mid-April and basically I moved to this new place that had no direct sunlight which is uh, very bad for this Joshua tree and as it turned out it's actually a great thing for some of my other plants such as the avocado and later on the mango which uh, resurrected and made a comeback. So at this point I'm just giving it a lot of tap water. The water demand started to increase for all my plants in spring and summer because there was a lot of growth so I wasn't using distilled water anymore um, at least not very often. So this is some more footage from Joshua Tree National Park. I made a visit with a friend and it's always a beautiful place to visit. Uh, this Joshua Tree is growing upside down and it sort of tries to adjust at the ends of its branches where there are uh, green foliage by curling upwards but it's a really gnarled and uh, misshapen tree very interesting to look at. Uh, trees like this aren't a dime a dozen but they are a fairly uh, notable and I wouldn't say common either occurrence. See, you can see another one here that's kind of bent over and they just come in all shapes and sizes. So this one was near an observation deck overlooking the canyons below and this is a uh, the view from my car as I was driving by on one of the main paved roads. So this Joshua Tree Forest is, uh, it's not too dense, but at the same time it's not too sparse either. In some areas where it's dense, it's uh, visually very appealing, but um, you can get a feel for our, what the average Joshua Tree looks like in Joshua Tree National Park. So it's just uh, miles after miles of this. And most of the Joshua trees are in the northwest, uh, I believe, of the park. And if you're driving through this and you come through that entrance or the northeast entrance, I actually wouldn't recommend driving out of the south end of the Joshua Tree National Park because there's like almost nothing there. So Joshua trees um, grow in this soil that can sometimes be very hard and compact with uh, a very high clay content but in other areas they can also do really well and grow much bigger in 
decomposed granite or uh, nearly pure sand. So this is a great Joshua tree. I don't know why it's fenced off. Maybe the park rangers found it notable. This was on one of the mountain hiking trails. Um, I actually prefer the level hiking trails um, that go sort of in, not, I wouldn't call them valleys, but uh, they go through the mountain passes and things like that. Um, this was going out south, which was uh, a mistake we'll probably never repeat again because the the southern half of the park is basically this, it's sort of a giant wasteland. And you'll be driving mile after mile. There's a Troya Garden, but after that, if you want to leave, you should just really turn back and go north because the park is so vast that you'll spend a ton of time just driving through the, the wasteland. Um, to the south where there's no Joshua trees. So this is the barber pole. I've shot an independent video of that before uh, many years ago. It's uh, about 40 feet tall. And these are some of the more interesting uh, Joshua trees near it. So these things age uh, very slowly. Uh, they grow very slowly. So basically saplings are considered to be trees that are over three feet tall. And that really means something different for a fruit tree like an avocado tree versus a Joshua tree. So this is the next day, day 1,878 back home. This is the state of my five-year-old Joshua tree. I think at this point it was almost exactly five years old. And you can see um, little bits of dried out roots uh, at the base of the trunk. So I've noticed that for a while and I thought Maybe in the beginning it had to do with um, just me putting banana peel blended smoothies on top and maybe that's where all the nutrients were so the roots would be attempting to grow there on the top but after I switched to this 50% uh, sand soil mixture, sand and clay soil, um, it's still happening so I don't really know why it's doing that. So in a few days, I decided to reduce the weekly dose of fertilizer from one of these big scoops. You can see this uh, big green plastic scoop to the other end, which is a small scoop. So I think that difference in concentration is really significant. It might be something like 15 fold. Um, so yeah, that's a huge difference. So I've been fertilizing every week. And the amount of water that I dissolve it in, plus this uh, crushed vitamin that I throw in for mostly magnesium and calcium to complete the nutrition profile that I'm feeding this. So the, the water that goes in on top of the tap water, it's uh, a varied volume. And this pot, there's not that much room, but as you can see with the other pots, uh, some of them can fit maybe two thirds of a gallon, others can fit an entire gallon. So yeah, as I was saying about the Joshua Tree National Park, um, southern half, it's basically got no Joshua trees and not much else to look at because uh, with Joshua trees, uh, they like a certain amount of elevation. It's said that maybe they like 2,500 feet to 6,500 feet. So. I guess you could divide by 3.28 if you want meters if you don't understand uh, the imperial system that we use here. So that's basically because as you go in the high desert below a certain elevation, say 2,500 feet, it looks all the same to us, but actually the amount of moisture that can be retained in the soil is greatly reduced because all the areas around there get about the same amount of rainfall, but the low lying areas are much hotter and generally it's hotter as you go lower in elevation as well and because of that the soil just can't retain enough moisture for joshua trees to grow i think that's just it so i heard about using sugar water to spray on the foliage of plants to get them to grow really fast it's said that you can get thousand pound pumpkins this way and i thought about it and it's basically um it sort of makes sense that sugar can be absorbed by the stomata on the undersides of leaves. I don't know where the stomata necessarily are distributed on a Joshua tree a blade because the structure is so different, but I'm assuming it's on the undersides. 
So sugar is sucrose and that's the main form of sugar. There are many different kinds of sugars within uh, plants and animals that are used. But this is the main one used for transport in the phloem, the vascular tissue of the plant, from the tissues that produce sugar via photosynthesis, the leaves and the trunk, to the sink organs such as the roots that need sugar from the sugar producing photosynthetic um, organs of the plant. So I had to make a dilution. I poured in one tablespoon. I'm trying to get one tablespoon per gallon, but this container only contains uh, the fourth of the volume, so I had to pour out three-fourths and add in more water um, mix along the way, and now I got it in a spray bottle. So I'm going to test this out. I tested it out on many of my other plants, and basically I didn't find anything that was really noteworthy. And I'll talk more about that later when I show you the actual spraying. So it's day 1,926 and I've lost some leaves. That's not necessarily indicative of me treating the plant poorly or the conditions being poor. Although, um, as you remember, I did move to a new place. So this place, uh, the balcony gets no direct sunlight. It hasn't since I moved here in April 2020 and it didn't until much later in the year due to the angles and the trajectory of the, the sun relative to this balcony. So it's uh, south facing. You would think it would get a lot more, but as I'll show you later in this, um, it took a few months to get direct sun on this and uh, these things grow in full sun in their native habitat in every place I've seen. So I'm spraying sucrose water all over this. It does have a lot of risks, such as leaving behind a sticky, gooey mess that can cause leaf burn. It'll also stick a lot of dust and may attract ants and other uh, undesirables, even parasites. Maybe it'll feed the scale insects and cause their numbers to explode. So there are quite a number of risks and if it doesn't go well, I have to spend a lot of time and energy to clean all of that off by washing it off with water. So it's, uh, it's a real pain if it doesn't work out, but I thought based on what I had heard on someone else's channel, um, Gary's Best Gardening, that it could be a potential shortcut that could really accelerate growth. I thought for such a slow growing plant, I just had to try it because uh, if it works, then I could be years and years ahead of everyone else in terms of how big I can get this thing to grow within, say, uh, 10 years, 20 years. So even at the five year mark, this compares very favorably in size and aesthetics and number of leaves to what I've seen other people have or what's out there in the desert save for maybe those uh, adventitious shoots, the suckers that get produced by plants that are basically cloning themselves. They like to do it at the base of their trunk. So they'll have a lot of clones of themselves growing out um, right next to the base of the trunk. So those, uh, since they get the nutrition and all the sugars from the parent tree, they can probably grow a lot faster than anything starting from seed. So it's day 1957. This balcony hasn't seen direct sunlight since I moved here four months ago. I'm starting to see the light, but it's on the other end of the balcony. It'll take probably another month before it gets to my Joshua tree. So the scale insect infestation got worse. This is footage from 22 days later. That's a lot of scale insects. It reminds me of the old days. In the meantime, I'll just use the other end of a plastic floss stick and scrape them off. But if it keeps getting worse, I'll just have to look for direct application insecticides, not uh, the imidacloprid that's supposed to provide this plant with systemic resistance, but never seemed to actually get the job done. It did really well, I think, for all of my other plants, the imidacloprid. But for this one, it's just... Um, Seems like scale insects are a lot tougher than most, and they do have these protective secretions, coverings that they make. So that's another thing, a shield of armor that can protect them from 
pesticides uh, even being sprayed directly on them. So it's a ugly looking parasite and um, it's quite a pain to have to scrape them off like this. But it's said that they don't necessarily do that much damage to the host plant. So I think even if they got out of hand, uh, the Joshua tree would still be alive. But I don't like to look at these things and they're hurting the plant in the long run. They're just sucking the, the juices out of it and eating its food. So um, at the ends of the leaves here in particular, it's kind of hard to scrape them off. The ones that are really flaky, that just um, kind of crumble into dust at the slightest touch, I think those are um, maybe dead. But as you can see in this process, I'm also scratching up the surface of the Joshua tree leaves too. So it's, uh, yeah, it's quite a chore to do this. And I'm only showing you a tiny fraction of what I actually did because I don't want to bore you and gross you out. But you'll have to do this for, I don't know, like 10 minutes every few months if you don't use uh, a pesticide that gets them all. So uh, a few days later, I finally got direct sunlight in mid-September 2020. So that's been a long time. So Joshua trees grow in full sun in the wild. Mine has never had full sun. It's always been on apartment balconies. And nevertheless, my tree looks a lot better than uh, the ones I've seen pictures of online where people say they're like three years old. And I've seen them in Facebook groups and things like that. So this one actually looks really different from all the wild ones. It's got really thin leaves. They look very healthy. There's a lot of them and the overall design of the plant is the same. It's just that the leaves are very thin and numerous in number, very dense. So that's uh, quite different from what you'll see in the wild. And I do believe that's probably mostly due to this growing up in partial sun. And in this year, actually a few months of shade as well, total shade. So it's a, a far cry from getting, let's say, uh, 12 or 14 hours of full sun on open high plains, um, desert savanna, etc. So um, I'm getting some good views of this and it looks a lot better in the sun. It's just much better to film my plants in uh, natural sunlight compared to LED panels that just can't be bright enough. And the quality, the video quality of filming in natural sunlight just can't be beat. So, um, yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take for this to grow into something that more resembles a tree. It's not even a sapling yet because it's not three feet tall. But uh, most sources do say, though, that Joshua trees grow like three inches per year in their first 10 years. So that's only 30 inches. That would be two and a half feet. And that's not even a meter tall. That's nothing. So uh, they're very slow growing. So on day 2003, I visited the Sima Dome in the Mojave Desert. So I had never heard of this place until I read the news that it burned down. So it's a granite dome that was created um, 80 to 180 million years ago. It's ancient. So the Sima Dome Joshua Tree Forest is the biggest and densest Joshua Tree Forest in the world. I was really shocked that I had never heard of this place until dry lightning started a fire that burned it all down. So on August 15th, a dry lightning strike, uh, just like in many other places on the west coast during that time, started uh, a massive fire. August is the hottest month in San Diego in most of Southern California and 69 square miles burned down so um, all of this is most of it's gone i haven't driven on all the roads um, when you make a trip this far there is a very limited range of what you can explore especially since you're probably going to go on a hike on one of the trails so this joshua tree um, was once pretty magnificent now it's just a charred husk and I will show you examples of where there may be some hope. But um, there's a lot of people that just say flat out that once a tree gets burned like this, it's dead. It won't make a comeback. 
but I'm thinking some of them can regenerate and I'll show you some examples later this one probably not so much but um, yeah this wasn't too long after the fire so I can only imagine how uh, grandiose and magnificent this place was before it all burned down and you can see some other plants uh, that might have been a juniper to the left that's um, uh, or maybe some other kind of bush and then this is a baby Joshua tree unsupported it's not a clone it's just growing out there and it has a really thick trunk compared to uh, even mine at home very woody looking trunk so uh, this place is super flat it said that it's growing in decomposed granite here which is uh, very very well aerated perhaps even more so than the sand the 90 plus percent sand that I've been growing many of my plants in. My Joshua tree is actually growing only in 50% sand, 50% filter clay soil. So it's very heavy in clay, but it's in a pot, one of those bottom watering pots that I had left over from years past that provides for great aeration from the watering tray. So this little cactus, mound cactus, is just reduced to a pile of ash. And this is one of those examples that uh, I said I was going to show you where I think there's some hope because this should have all been burned. But as you can see, it sort of looks like there's a, a bit of regeneration going on at the tips here. I don't know if this tree originally was like this or did it fall over afterwards. Um, it's really hard to say, but it's uh, green at all its tips, whereas uh, that bigger tree that I showed you uh, just a minute ago that was burned to a crisp completely so I think this is new growth and that's uh, it's a great sign for this Joshua tree forest if some of these trees can come back and they're still alive uh, it's obviously much quicker for the Joshua tree forest to come back from a really well developed root system since the roots are underground um, most of them the root mass won't have been burned so um, that's a, a huge store of energy and water collection that can uh, really propel uh, new shoots for the future so there's a dust devil in the distance here that spot has a lot of dust devils um, this place is vast it's much bigger than Joshua Tree National Park it's in the Mojave National Preserve so it was a four and a half hour drive from San Diego for me and depending on where you live in San Diego, it might even take five hours. So this is a really rough day trip uh, that I did with a friend. And as you can see here, we're kind of walking up this SEMA dome. It's very gently sloped. It's not because I'm holding the camera askew. But as you can see, the density of the Joshua trees is uh, really high. You see very few places in Joshua Tree National Park to have this kind of Joshua tree density. And as I was saying earlier, um, for Joshua Tree National Park, if you try to exit through the south at the end of the day when you're all tired and you've had a long day, it takes forever to drive out of there. Um, but the Mojave National Preserve, uh, I think most of the spots have Joshua trees. They prob there are probably areas uh, like Joshua Tree National Park where it's just creosote and... Uh, other things like maybe Acatillo that are, are more boring to me um, but yeah you can see this place has been laid waste to and I think uh, maybe Joshua Tree National Park has some fires once in a while as well but nothing as extensive as this uh, the Mojave is very sparsely populated it's very far away from the population centers of Southern California that's why most people have never heard of this place. It's actually closer to Las Vegas, Nevada. So it's about two hours away from the Strip, uh, maybe an hour away from Prim, Nevada. So maybe you could book a hotel room there to serve as a base of operations to make this uh, trip easier and spend uh, two or three days visiting this Mojave National Preserve. So I have noticed in the past that on the way to Vegas, there's a... Uh, a lot of Joshua trees and they do seem quite dense in certain parts in the low-lying um, valleys or uh, plains of the desert out there so it's a great place to visit um, I'll definitely make 
more trips in the future. That was my very first trip. And in my next trip, which will probably be included in the next episode, I'll probably be showing you footage of how the Joshua trees regenerated or didn't and how the desert's doing after a brutal fire like that. So there's a uh, red brome and other invasive grasses and maybe some native grasses that shouldn't be there as well that are just matting the desert floor and because of that um, the whole Joshua tree ecosystem is disturbed by fire because normally Joshua trees are supposed to be spaced very far apart and these leaves are very fire resistant as I've shown you in the past when I tried to burn uh, one of the dead leaves it doesn't catch on fire very easily but normally they're spaced far apart so um, the forest isn't uh, able to just like burn like a normal forest at a high density does so in arid regions uh, the concept of a forest is really different but with these uh, invasive grasses and native grasses that are just carpeting the desert floor it's like one fire will set everything on fire and destroy all the trees which may not be able to regenerate uh, but hopefully they can so on day 2025 uh, I got a new backpack sprayer that I'm showing you here it's almost out of water here but it's a great tool to help wash off any of that uh, residual sugar that was uh, sprayed onto my plant so regarding the sugar experiment it didn't really work for my uh, other plants and I even soaked the mango leaves in sugar water for um, let's see more than two days I believe um, at least it was 30 hours so if nothing happens in two days then nothing ever will basically the leaves didn't drown they didn't get damaged or burned um, so yeah uh, getting back to the topic in front of us I decided to spray some fungicide this is spectricide mycobutanol it's uh, worked wonders on some of my other plants um, that had fungal growth such as pomegranate and even the jackfruit seedlings um, so they want you to use half a fluid ounce um, per gallon of water that's about one part of fungicide per 255 parts of water so the reason I'm going to use this on my Joshua tree is because it seemed to help a lot for two of my other plants at least maybe three of them and I know this isn't a fruit tree and it's vastly different. It's a succulent, but I figured the leaves are tough. There is really no harm in trying this out just in case the Joshua tree does suffer from some sort of fungal infection. This could stop it and hence promote much faster growth. And hopefully it does something for some of my other plants that are struggling as well. So uh, you can see the power of this sprayer. It's very efficient. I don't have to hand pump I don't have to use a squeaky spray bottle and just in a matter of seconds I get everything covered from all different angles so it's a very nifty device it's really fun to use um, to wash various things or to uh, clean your leaves off or even to water uh, some of the plants that are smaller and provide that gentle touch without knocking everything over so on day 2046, exactly at 5.6 years, I noticed this. This is what looks to be a baby Joshua tree. It looks like my seedlings from five years ago. This is how they start. They've got that curl to them and this kind of glossy uh, texture and grooves. So I'm thinking this is a Joshua tree. It does look like it may have exposed roots. Um, it does not look like some of the weedy grasses that I've seen around in San Diego. So I'm going to bury some of these uh, dry roots, that very fine roots that keep appearing on the top in the center next to the trunk with 90% uh, sand. This is basically pure sand. Um, I do have some filtered clay soil in there, but at less than 10%, it's negligible and uh, clay in small amounts is a great holder of nutrients and water anyway. So uh, that's pretty much it for this episode. I really am excited for that little possible adventitious shoot, uh, a little clone of this Joshua tree happening at just five years. Um, that five years is nothing for a Joshua tree. So it's all really exciting 
and uh, I can't wait to show you some more progress in the future. Thanks for watching.